Hi, Dr. Aki. Hi, Dr. Alsati. Hey, Akansha, how are you? Good, how are you? Doing well, thank you very much. Let I'll be messaging. The... Say that again? Let me message in the group that uh, we have joined. Please go ahead, you were saying something. No, I was just saying that I am uh, listening in the background. Sure, so yeah. I'll mute myself, okay. Hi, Dr. Aki, can you, you're on mute. Let me unmute you. Hi, Akanksha, and hi, everyone. How are you feeling now? <laughs> I'm feeling a little bit better than the last three days. So thank you for asking. Uh, you still sound some stuffed. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a nasal twang to my voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, glad that you could attend our session. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, it's uh, his host is disabled screen sharing. So yeah, let me enable that. Okay, now you should be able to. Cool. So I was hoping that we could do a combination of uh, a path presenter and New Michigan, depending on what we have available in each of, because I tried to uh, search for hepatitis and in the path presenter and there's only hep C and not hep B. And I think uh, New mm -hmm. Michigan, Michigan has hep B here. Mm -hmm. so, is that okay? Yeah, sure. Yeah, whatever you feel like. You are the teacher here, so you have the control. You are the boss. <laughs> Do what you feel like. Okay, cool. So should, should we wait? Do we have more people joining? We have enough like people that they will start joining eventually, so we can start. Okay, with sounds good. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll get started, and uh, you know, if you have any questions, now I see that Dr. Alsati is here too, so. If there's anything that I missed, feel free to um, jump in and mention that as well, Dr. Alsati. Oh, Dr. Akiki, you're talking to the wrong person. I don't do livers. I'm here to oh, learn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thank you so much. I'm, uh, I'm very focused and I would love to learn from you. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, cool. So let's start with... Um, the common injuries, because I wanted to like go through something that's, you know, that most uh, pathologists, you know, even in private practice may encounter these common entities. So let's go through those first and then, you know, go into the little bit more um, uncommon ones. And so, you know, as we all know, uh, hepatitis is, is a common pattern of injury, especially chronic hepatitis pattern of injury. And so, um, uh, let's start by doing that. Um, so I'll start with the chronic hepatitis C here. Let's see what we have. Um, so the one thing that's pretty common um, uh, with the chronic hepatitis pattern of injury, uh, we frequently see that in viral hepatitis, uh, both hep B and hep C and then uh, autoimmune hepatitis. Uh, all three can have a uh, chronic hepatitis pattern of injury. Now, uh, viral hepatitis can, will almost always have an acute hepatitis presentation, but uh, liver biopsy is not done frequently in uh, acute hepatitis, um, mainly because clinicians are usually aware that it's an acute hepatitis pattern of injury. And you know, even before they realize, you know, um, it's either subsided or they already have uh, serum evidence of uh, infection because they, uh, you know, experienced hepatologists tend to do their workup really well before even they start thinking about doing liver biopsy. So 
they have an idea, you know, if it's uh, elevated hep hepatitis uh, A or hepatitis E or B or C infection because of acute hepatitis. So we very, very rarely get acute hepatitic pattern of injury livers um, uh, for the purpose of diagnosis. Um, one of the reasons we do get acute hepatitis pattern of injury is um, their serum levels of um, viruses are normal and they don't know what's happening, but the, uh, the uh, liver transaminases are elevated, ALT and AST. And so um, the hepatologists then decide that they're going to do the biopsy to find out you know, if we can tell them any etiology for the cause of um, uh, elevated liver enzymes. And, and that's one of the very few times we see acute hepatitic pattern of injury. So otherwise commonly, uh, chronic hepatitis is the uh, more common pattern of injury. So um, if I do come across any acute hepatitic injury, I will show you. I think there is one somewhere that I was uh, browsing earlier. Uh, but let's start with the chronic hepatitis pattern of injury. So this, um, as you can see on low par, um, uh, the biopsy looks pretty much, you know, the liver parenchyma looks uh, unremarkable, except you can see that there is blueness in the portal areas. And so whenever you see that on low power like this, um, you start thinking about, oh, this looks like you know, chronic hep uh, hepatitis pattern of injury. So let's go closer and see what's happening in these portal areas. And you know, when you come closer, you can see that uh, the portal areas are busy and you see a, uh, a lot of inflammatory cells. And Predominantly, when you go closer, you see that these are all lymphocytes. Um, and then very rarely, I think you can spot uh, plasma cells, but mostly these are lymphocytes. And so when you see that, then um, you know, it is the chronic pattern. But another feature that you see in this particular portal area is it's not just the lymphocytes are you know, uh, haphazardly uh, uh, present there they're forming these lymphoid aggregates. And so that's something that you commonly uh, anticipate or see in uh, hepatitis uh, C pattern of uh, injury. Um, so it's a soft sign. Again, you can never be sure until, you know, serology shows uh, 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 hepatitis C virus. So they do do, um, um, uh, RNA uh, uh, amplification and, and they see you know, if the target is detected or not. Um, so for hep B, they do the DNA um, and then they know whether there is uh, target amplification or not. And then that's how we know that the virus is still there uh, active. Um, but otherwise, without the serology, this pattern of injury, you know, a lot of times uh, as an academic institution, we do get biopsies that look like this, uh, but we get very little history. So liver is one thing where um, clinical pathologic correlation is extremely important. Without uh, history, we uh, cannot interpret the biopsy 100% uh, accurately. So we do ask the uh, sending uh, clinic or hospital to give us uh, as much history as they can. And sometimes despite repeated requests, we don't get the history. And in those cases, we end up signing it out uh, or top lining it as chronic hepatitis pattern of injury, see comment. And then in the comment, we do tell them um, that, you know, this pattern can be seen in these conditions, mainly in a viral hepatitis B and C chronic and then um, autoimmune hepatitis. And um, if, you know, depending on the clinical concern, they need to work up all these things uh, to know uh, accurate cause of this pattern of injury. Um, but when we do get the history, it makes it easier for us. Um, usually lobules uh, are pretty unremarkable in chronic hepatitis C. Um, the activity is mainly in the uh, portal areas and almost 90% of the times you don't really see any bile duct uh, injury. 
uh, all you have is portal aggregation of lymphocytes. Um, there can be a little bit of, uh, depending on uh, how severe the disease process is, there can be either minimal, mild, moderate, or severe interface activity sometimes. Um, by that, I mean spillover of lymphocytes into the um, uh, surrounding periportal hepatocytes. Um, and, and, and a lot of times the liver biopsies that we get, um, you know, uh, they're treated to some extent with the antivirals. So we don't really see too much uh, activity either. Um, so in this case, I would just call it uh, chronic hepatitis C pattern of injury consistent with uh, clinical history of hep C, if we have that history. Um, and I, I usually would say mild to moderate activity for this, because uh, it's not the spillover into the lobules is not that much. Uh, and, and that's about it. Uh, uh, Dr. Aki, when do you raise suspicion for a lymphoma? I mean, how much expanded should be the lymphoid? And do you, how often do you do stains like 3 and 20 or, without a clinical suspicion? Uh, not not very often. We really have to see um, a lot of expansion of the portal areas, you know, beyond what we normally see for chronic hepatitis. So say for instance, in this case, uh, let's see, uh, on low power, this particular portal area looks busy. When I go there, see the lymphoid aggregate is not too large, right? It's, it's a small lymphoid aggregate. But for instance, the, the time that we suspect, you know, some kind of hematolymphoid um, neoplasm is that this particular portal area would be more than two or three times this size. Because um, we look at the size of the bile ducts and compare the size of the actual portal area too. You know, for a, for a bile duct of this size or these sizes, this is somewhat of a um, slightly expanded portal area. But with the same sized bile duct, if we have, you know, three or four times the size of this portal area, then that portal area is massively expanded. Um, it's not just the expansion of the portal area, it should be filled with these um, monotonous looking lymphocytes, right? Um, and, and that's when we suspect uh, that something is not right here. Okay, and in the chronic hepatitis, do you also see some like majority of the cells would be like lymphocyte and there can be few uh, plasma cells. Do you see some neutrophils too, like now and then, or that changes your thinking if you start seeing neutrophils? Um, very rarely. Um, it, it usually doesn't change our thinking too much unless we see a lot of it, you know, because one thing we can think about, especially if the neutrophils are in the lumen, of the bile ducts and that worries us, you know, if there is ascending cholangitis or something. Um, but mm -hmm. usually we, we, that doesn't bother us too much. You know, uh, the one time frequently we see neutrophils is when they do subcapsular biopsies, um, especially post-transplant, because a lot of times these days, patients are getting these, uh, uh, the donors are hep C donors, you know, they die in road traffic accident and, um, the recipient gets the hep C infected liver as their transplant liver. Um, and then uh, the, the, the protocol at our place is, you know, they do time zero biopsy, but then they also do day three and day seven biopsies. And then day three, they still haven't closed the abdomen. This is um, pretty recent. In the last two years, we have having these two transplant surgeons who don't completely close the abdomen. They leave it somewhat open and go back on day three to like uh, evacuate all the, the serous secretions and, and, and then make sure that there are no biliary strictures and then they completely close the abdomen. So when they do that, uh, when they're going to do that, they do take a subcapsular wedge biopsy of the liver and we do see a ton of neutrophils then. Um, and I, we attribute it to surgical hepatitis, meaning, you know, it's there because it's procedure related. Um, but otherwise, no, not really. 
we don't really see that many new actually i'm asking because i this is my like second case where i see like nodular cirrhosis it, uh, for a like they were liver biopsy done and there was like cirrhosis kind of stage 4 and mm -hmm. the fibrotic tract and portal tract they had like lymphohistocytic infiltrate and along with it like there were neutrophils uh, in the those fibrotic tracts and even in the portal area like there were some mm -hmm. and the uh, consultant like who reported those did not mention those neutrophil and was only like trying to stay like, say like it's uh, cirrhosis grade three stage four and then the differential this and this and even in the microscopic description so i was just wondering is it something we have to like overlook or it's like is, it, does it like make a difference if we see them so the um only two times that i can think of at the top of my head that we do mention neutrophils is when we know there is a biliary stricture, you know, um, mm -hmm. that can give rise to bile ductular reaction within the portal area. If there is a biliary stricture anywhere that's affecting the flow of bile. And I then, did see bile duct proliferation. Yeah, that, that was something to- So do. usually neutrophils are associated with ductular proliferation. So that is one instance where um, we mention it, but we also make a note that it's associated with ductal reaction. And the second time is cholangitis, like I was saying, neutrophils in the bile duct lumen. Um, and usually uh, if it's truly cholangitis, you can see inspissated bile in the bile ducts too. Um, so those are the only two instances where we mention it, otherwise we ignore it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You mentioned about mild to moderate interface activity. Uh, can you briefly tell how do you grade mild, moderate, and severe in there? Um, sure. Uh, to be honest, um, a lot of it, you know, I struggled initially when I started, you know, my fellowship and starting uh, as a faculty, but um, it comes with a little bit with experience once you see them, because it's a uh, it's a somewhat subjective. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there's no, like, you know, if it, there is criteria. This, yeah. Um, there's no like strict guidelines, like uh, if you see 10%, you have to say mild, if you see 30%, you have to say moderate, it's nothing like that. Um, mm -hmm. So if the spillover into the um, portal area, into the periportal lymphocytes is like minimal in majority of the portal tracts, then you can call it minimal. If the spillover is mild, like, you know, you have to, uh, how do I say that? Because here I'm not really seeing that much. It's kind of minimal here, it's below. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if there is extensive spillover of these lymphocytes, you know, uh, mm -hmm. in, in a majority of the portal tract, say for instance, the portal tract ends here and you're seeing mm -hmm. a lot of lymphocytes in the surrounding areas and, mm -hmm. and not just in one portal area, you should be able to see that in at least, you know, 80% of the portal areas. And that's when you call it severe activity, um, mm -hmm. meaning it's chronic hepatitis, but it's, it's uh, quite severe that can, you know, eventually lead to um, bridging fibrosis and cirrhosis. And that's why we grade it that way. Um, right. Yeah. And then, you know, anything between mild and severe is moderate. Right. Got you. It's, and it's um, another question that comes to my mind is that uh, so this kind of portal uh, lymphocytic infiltration or nodules, uh, if you don't have any kind of history and you can't find any kind of history, um, of course you can call the clinician. But apart from that, what are the differentials apart from the chronic hepatitis and autoimmune, as you mentioned, that we can mention in our reports? So aside from chronic uh, viral hepatitis and autoimmune, you can think of um, uh, uh, drug-induced liver injury sometimes can have this pattern. Um, the other thing is, again, I'm not saying, I don't want that to be the take-home message, but something to consider is uh, PBC as well. Um, mm -hmm. Because... PBC can have this pattern, uh, but you know you have to see fluorid duct lesion, which if you don't see, then it's really low on your list. But that's something mm -hmm. that you can still consider, uh, mm -hmm. provided they they've ruled out everything. Um, those are the two that I can think of: drug and and PBC that can have somewhat this kind of pattern. But again, not the top differential. They kind of 
the bottom difference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, and then the other thing is if I'm not sure if they have a trichrome associated with this chronic hepatitis, probably not. Let me check. Um, so they have randomly placed the slides in there. Um, yeah. It, you might have it, but there are like so many slides. Yeah, I don't see a trichrome because I, I use the search term hepatitis here and I only got these uh, eight and 12, 13, 14 slides. So mm -hmm. I don't see a trichrome. So usually, you know, as you know, we don't work up a liver just with H&E, you know. We always look at the um, um, trichrome to estimate uh, what stage it is because clinicians invariably want to know. Um, because as you may know that um, uh, there is regression of uh, fibrosis with treatment. Um, so clinicians try very hard to you know, salvage the liver because um, you know transplant is a risky business anyway, and you know for the recipient it's a lifelong um, immunosuppression. So they try to keep the native liver as long as possible. So um, we invariably drew a trichrome to look for the staging. So as you know, um, staging is pretty much what uh, we uh, do the the Lutz and Batwick system for for staging stage one, two, three, and four. Uh, some places do use the ISHAC scoring system, uh, which is a six stage one. Um, uh, neither, uh, well, either is fine. There's nothing wrong. It depends on which one your hepatologists are comfortable with. Um, so uh, we frequently use uh, um, the Bats and Ludwigs, which is four, is, uh, four stage, uh, but sometimes some of our uh, older hepatologists ask for the ISHAC staging too. So uh, in parenthesis, we, we give them that if they ask for it. Um, so yeah, uh, with the four, four stage uh, grading uh, system, you know, it's either portal fibrosis, just expansion of portal areas uh, is stage one. And when you start to see tentacles going out a little bit from the portal areas, um, on trichrome, then that is portal and periportal fibrosis, which is uh, stage two. And then uh, when tentacles from neighboring portal areas start fusing um, and form, start forming like these delicate bridges, and that's when you can start thinking about stage three. So if it's only focal, we say stage two dash three, uh, meaning that it's still in the tra transition. And then if there is clear cut bridging, we say stage three. And then, you know, when we start seeing nodule formation, that's when we say that, you know, it's kind of reaching uh, uh, stage four. Um, so that's something that we need uh, uh, trichrome for. The other stains that we routinely use are PASD for looking at alpha-1 antitrypsin globules and uh, uh, iron stain for any iron uh, uh, deposition. So uh, I think the path presenter does not have uh, uh, Hep B. So I think I found one Hep B on the U Michigan site, I think. So this is a Hep B. So let's see if uh, we have any questions. This is taking a longer to open up completely. Sorry, it's taking quite a long time to open up. So for this one, they said it's chronic uh, hepatitis B.
is this your experience too, Akanksha, that it takes quite a long time to open? No, it is not like that. Um, are you opening in the web scope or the image scope? I don't have either of those options here. Am I using the right oh. web scope? Yeah, you are using the right to open image. That's the one that it should open. Um, I don't know, It's it should be faster than this. I mean, what we have experienced with it, it is usually faster. Okay, so this they designated as chronic hepatitis B, but I'm not seeing too much inflammation in the portal areas here. Um, I was hoping I could show some ground glass hepatocytes here. Once again, the, the ground glass hepatocytes in uh, Hep B is not, it's not always there. Uh, it's helpful when it's there. It's, it's still a soft sign, but um, if it's not there, it doesn't exclude it. So invariably when our clinicians um, uh, want to know how, you know, they, they'll, they'll do the serum testing, but they still want to see how extensively the virus is incorporated in the hepatocytes. They do ask us to do the, the surface and core antigen staining immunohistochemistry. And I think this particular case, they had the stain here. Let's see. Not sure why this is doing this. Yeah, some of the liver slides are not opening. I, yeah. I noted that too. I don't know if they are not stand well or something, but it's not opening in my testing too. See, a lot of them are not opening. Um, well, so this particular one you can see, again, this was designated hep, hep B, and there is, just like hep C, there is, um, a lot of portal inflammation here, uh, but you don't necessarily see lymphoid aggregates. Again, even seeing lymphoid aggregates is not 100% specific, but it's more helpful. Um, it kind of favors more hep C than hep B, but um, it's not like pathognomonic. Um, for maybe for board's purposes it is, but <laughs> in real practice it's not. Um, But the other features uh, are very similar. So you, you would grade the activity as mild, moderate, severe. And then um, you look at the lobules, usually you know, lobular inflammation is not that much um, unless it's like severely active um, or um, uh, chronic hepatitis with uh, severe activity. Um, and then you, you stage the fibrosis. Um, Somehow. When you say lobular activity, is it like uh, in around the hepatocyte there is like new, uh, like like neutrophilic infiltrate or lymphocytic infiltrate or it could be either lymphocytic infiltrate. So um, there is a little bit of the terms can be confusing. So I'll go back to this path presenter and and try to explain it. Um, the terms can be confusing the, mainly. The turkey. Yeah. I have a web scope and image scope in my system. I mean, I, I don't know if you do, why don't you have, uh, are you using a Chrome? Uh, yes, I'm using Chrome. I have a web scope and an image scope. Can, and, you, uh, can you tell me the URL maybe? I will type it and see here. Uh, or you can... I'll send you in the WhatsApp. Uh, sure. Please go ahead, I, I interrupted you, please go ahead. That's okay. Yeah, but those slides, they are not all opening, as you said. They are not all opening. I was hoping that if I, if I could open in my system, I could have projected too and we could have talked about it. That's true, that's yeah. true. Yeah. So um, what I was trying to tell was um, the terms can be confusing because we use activity even in chronic hepatitis, but in chronic hepatitis, the activity that we are referring to is mainly in the portal area. So that's what's graded as mild, moderate, and severe, and it's based on the lymphocytes spillover uh, into the neighboring hepatocytes. 
Um, but in acute hepatitis, we have more lobular inflammation. And so when I say lobular, it's the area between the portal areas. So um, as you know, you have uh, central uh, vein and, and the hepatocytes surrounding the central vein um, is you know zone three, right? So um, all this area between the, say for instance, this is one big portal area and this is one big portal area, the entire uh, region here is what we refer to as lobules usually. And in, um, I can even, why don't we open, I think this one has an acute uh, hepatitis. That way it makes it easier to show, let's see. Maybe it's in, maybe it's in one of these autoimmune, let's see. No, not this one. I did see earlier, let's see. Maybe it was in the drug, I think, drug. Yeah. yeah, none of these slides are opening for some reason, like, uh... I'm also trying the head B that you were seeing. Okay. So um, just to give you an example, so this is what acute hepatitis pattern of injury will look like. So if you contrast it with something like this, so here, this was, this is the chronic hepatitis pattern of injury. See that the blue areas are mainly in the portal uh, regions, right? But here, you know, on low power, the blueness is throughout the core of the liver. And it's sometimes even harder to tell where the portal area is and where the actual lobule, meaning that the region between the portal areas is because it's so blue everywhere. Um, and so when we talk about acute hepatitis, we're talking about the activity here in the lobules between in the hepatocytes that are between the portal areas, meaning like hepatocytes between zone, uh, the, the two zone ones, because uh, portal area is considered zone one. Um, and then any area between that, you know, area around the central vein is zone three. And so we go from zone three to zone two to zone one. So all these areas between the portal areas um, is considered lobule for, for the purpose of description. And so whenever you see um, inflammatory cells in the lobules, uh, both lymphocytes and sometimes in uh, acute hepatitis, you can see neutrophils too. Uh, and that's what's lobular activity. But when in the chronic hepatitis pattern, when we say activity, it's portal activity. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it does. So, okay, um, so I can take a minute to like go through this, this, uh, these slides or these needle course to kind of go through what, what we expect in um, acute hepatitic pattern of injury. So uh, without going into the actual case per se, um, this is something that we would see with uh, acute hepatitic pattern of injury. So as you saw in the previous one, the chronic, the inflammation was mainly confined to the portal areas, but see here, it's like everywhere uh, throughout the, the core of the uh, needle biopsy. And which means that the inflammation is both in the lobules, meaning hepatocytes that are surrounding the central veins, um, as well as the hepatocytes surrounding the portal areas um, and in the portal areas itself. So um, a, a number of things are happening here. One is uh, one of the terms that we use to describe this acute hepatitic pattern of injury is um, lobular disarray, which means that the hepatocytes are arranged in a very haphazard manner. 
in, in a somewhat normal liver, again, this is not normal because this has chronic hepatitis C, but if you ignore, the, ignore what's going on in the portal areas and just look at the hepatocytes themselves, the arrangement of hepatocytes here is not disrupted. They're arranged in one to two cell uh, core uh, thickness, uh, and they're very even, uh, evenly spaced, uh, hepatocytes and, and there's no uh, or not much inflammatory cells here and everything looks very quiet. There's not much happening. On the other hand, if you look at the lobule here, um, the hepatocytes are extremely haphazard. They're not in this uniform linear trabecular arrangement. They're kind of swollen in some areas. They, they they're reacting to all these inflammatory cells. And if you see even closer, you see these pink dots, these are dead hepatocytes and, they, and that's what we refer to as acidophil bodies. Um, so there's that happening. Lots of hepatocytes are dying. You know, there are innumerable acidophil bodies here. This is almost like dying hepatocyte. And these are all dead hepatocytes, all these pink globules. And then see the inflammatory cells. They're mainly uh, lymph lymphocytes here, and maybe occasional plasma cells too. Um, not too many neutrophils, at least not in this particular field. So this is lobular disarray, and there is a ton of inflammatory cells here. And even here, uh, we can use the term mild, moderate, and severe. Again, very subjective. But when it's like panacinar inflammation like this, this is severe, uh, severely active hepatitis. Um, and then there's a lot more happening here than just active hepatitis. There's loss of hepatic parenchyma. Um, you know, see these these are not like retained hepatocytes, and these are retained hepatocytes. But then um, in the middle, we don't see too many hepatocytes. So there, the hepatocytes are. Um, lost. Uh, so we call that parenchymal loss. And so that's uh, when that happens, the liver tries to regenerate by uh, ductular reaction. So in this liver, a lot of times it's hard to tell, you know, which one is a true portal area versus bile ductular reaction or proliferation due to loss of uh, parenchyma. Like in, in areas like this, where there is loss of parenchyma, you can see sometimes um, ductal proliferation too. So this kind of insult can happen with um, commonly acute uh, viral hepatitis. So A, B, C, or D. Um, well, A, B, C mainly, um, not D, A, B, C, and, and sometimes with uh, hepatitis E for elephant, uh, which is more common in like Mexico and India. Um, and then it can happen with acute autoimmune hepatitis when um, when there is a flare of autoimmune hepatitis, you can have this happen. And then um, drug or toxins can induce this pattern of injury too. Um, so when, when we get this, uh, the purpose of the biopsy is somewhat twofold for the clinicians. One is to tell what the etiology might be or what's happening here. So we tell them that you know, uh, it's acute hepatitic pattern of injury. Uh, we tell them how severe it is, you know, mild, moderate, severe, and this one is severe. There's a loss of, uh, extensive loss of hepatic parenchyma. And then they'll ask us, you know, do you think this liver um, uh, is sustainable? Meaning that should we start thinking about transplant for this patient? So uh, even though there is no cirrhosis, because the reason they ask that question is in severe acute hepatitic pattern of injury, especially if it's due to autoimmune or drug or toxin mediated, uh, when there is extensive loss of parenchyma, then the patient cannot continue with the residual uh, liver that's functioning. Their liver function deteriorates, even though it's not cirrhotic because they've lost a ton of uh, liver parenchyma. So they have to put them on a transplant list almost immediately. Um, so that's, those are the uh, few uh, points that we can give the clinician or a few pieces of information that helps them uh, make decisions. 
Can you um, tell like um, how much percent of uh, loss of liver parenchyma should we see in order to not be able to transplant? Well, um, up to about 70%, um, you know, if, if there is loss of over 70% of liver parenchyma, then they have to be transplanted as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. um, just because you never know when the remaining 30% might give up uh, and you don't, uh, and we've seen this in, in, in the last four or five years, I've, I've seen this in like at least two or three patients, uh, young patients, someone in like their twenties and thirties who had no clue that they had autoimmune hepatitis going on. And they had this uh, couple of flares. And by the time they came in, they had lost substantial amount of liver parenchyma without knowing that they had this disease brewing in the background. And they biopsied this patient. And we said that, you know, patient has lost more than 70% of their liver parenchyma. And so that patient was put on transplant list. So, Anything under 70%, there is still hope that, uh, not hope of recovery, but hope of continuing to do well with whatever is remaining. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, uh, if again, you know, we, uh, the information that we give on a liver biopsy is, as you know, is based on a couple of course that we get. So we are trying to extrapolate uh, what we see on these course to what's happening in the entire liver, right? Um, so our clinicians, if they're really good, they try to sample, especially in these kind of cases where they're suspecting parenchyma loss, they try to uh, get these needle cores from different parts of the liver, like, you know, uh, four different quadrants so that mm -hmm. if all four cores show similar loss of parenchyma, then we can be sure that majority of the liver, like we can be sure that these cores are representative of what's happening in the, in the rest of the liver. But if they've only given us, you know, the right low biopsy or the left low biopsy, and then we say that, you know, uh, in the comment, we kind of include a sentence saying that if this is truly representative of what's happening in the background liver and parenchyma, then um, it's consistent with approximately 60% parenchyma loss or something like that. Um, and, and we communicate that with the clinicians too, because these usually come as rush liver biopsies and we talk to them and say, hey, look, you know, this patient has lost a lot of liver parenchyma. Uh, or we say that, you know, about 50% of the parenchyma is lost. They still have 50 remaining. You know, you still have a couple of years for them to move forward without a transplant, something like that. Mm -hmm. Got you. Thank you. Yeah. So... Um, the other, uh, acute hepatitis, well, well, chronic hepatitis pattern is the autoimmune. Uh, let's see which ones are good. So once again, you know, autoimmune can present, you know, acutely. Uh, or uh, chronically. And when it presents chronically, you know, these patients uh, present with either um, fatigue, uh, some kind of mild pain in the right upper quadrant, sometimes jaundice, or, or they, uh, uh, they present for some other disease process and um, liver enzymes are done for just routine testing and they see elevated liver enzymes and uh, that's how some of these patients come to attention too. So as you can see from low power, once again, the portal areas is where everything's happening. Um, blue portal areas is very characteristic of chronic hepatitis pattern of injury. And then when you go in, uh, zoom in, you can see that the plasma cells are somewhat prominent. I think this is the highest I can go, but if I don't know if you can notice all these are plasma cells. Yeah, they're visible. They're nice. yeah. So um, once you start seeing quite a few plasma cells, then autoimmune is kind of high on your differential. Um, and depending on how bad the activity is, uh, meaning like the spillover of the lymphocytes from the portal areas into the lobules, 
Um, it can be mild, moderate, or severe, just like the hep, hep B and hep C. And in this case, I think it's at least mild in here because you're seeing some spillover in, in this area. Do you appreciate that? A spillover of lymphocytes and plasma cells into the neighboring periportal hepatocytes. Yeah. And then, yes, we do. Yeah. And then um, as, as it gets uh, worse, you can even see clusters of plasma cells in the lobules here too, away from the portal areas. So I'm trying to see if we have those kind of foci here. Somewhat like this, you know, because um, we have a busy portal area here and a busy portal area here. And, you know, in, in between, you're seeing some clusters of plasma cells here. Um, and so that tells you that it actually helps you, um, makes you more confident to call it autoimmune when you start seeing, you know, plasma cells in the, in the lobules. I'm not saying that every time you see plasma cells and um, in the portal areas and lobules, uh, it has to be autoimmune. Uh, a lot of times, uh, any kind of immune mediated injury to the liver, say for instance, um, sometimes drugs and toxins, can induce uh, autoimmune type hepatitis in the liver um, because body is reacting or, or these drugs uh, trigger uh, uh, immune response uh, to the uh, uh, epitopes that, that are uh, uh, because of the, the drugs or the toxin somehow triggers uh, uh, abnormal epitope formation on the hepatocytes in the liver and then that in turn triggers uh, plasma cell response. So it's drug-induced autoimmune uh, hepatitis in that case. Um, so, but, but overall, if you know that the patient's uh, serum ANA is elevated uh, and ASMA is, is very helpful, just ANA is not solely used. Uh, if you have ANA and um, smooth muscle, antigen, then that's more helpful to kind of seal the diagnosis. And if it responds to um, steroids, it's even more um, helpful that, that it is indeed autoimmune hepatitis. So see here the spillover of uh, lymphocytes and plasma cells into the lobular parenchyma. Mm -hmm. And then in this case, I think it's a little bit advanced and you can see that um, these portal areas are a lot more expanded. Look, so if you compare this portal area here to this one, this is a much expanded post portal area. Although there is not much inflammation, um, it's, it's kind of giving me a sense that this is at least you know, stage two fibrosis because there's a much larger portal area that's um, in the same area where you have smaller portal areas too. And even here, you can see that this one portal area is so much expanded. And if you were to do trichrome, you can see these small extensions going away from the portal area. So portal and periportal fibrosis um, uh, can be noted. So one of our um, liver attendings used to say that autoimmune hepatitis, yes, plasma cells, but uh, interface hepatitis is also kind of uh, usually seen is that something that happens and uh, is it any specific it's not a hundred percent specific but in terms of description uh, the term is somewhat synonymous with autoimmune hepatitis especially you know clinicians because uh, mm -hmm. they have limited understanding of the terminologies that we use so whenever we say there is interface hepatitis they, for them, it means autoimmune hepatitis. So um, this is what is uh, referred to as interface hepatitis. So you can see that this is a big portal area. On, on low power, you can see this is all portal area. And then there is both plasma cells and lymphocytes. And then here, they're spilling over into the neighboring hepatocytes. So this is interface activity. And that's something that's conventionally been used with autoimmune, but like I said, you know, you can see that with um, viral hepatitis too. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, like I said, in 
when we make diagnosis on liver biopsies, we don't rely on one factor alone. It has to be a combination of things. Everything has to fall into place for us to like confidently call it autoimmune hepatitis. So, you know, clinical history, how the patient presented, we have to make sure, you know, a thorough clinician or a hepatologist will do their background workup very thoroughly. And, and that gives us confidence in making these diagnoses better. Um, so they would have wor already worked up these patients for uh, all the viral markers. So if the viral markers are negative, the autoimmune markers, especially ANA and um, ASMA, uh, are elevated. Sometimes in, in about 10 to 20% of cases, uh, instead of ASMA, you can have um, anti-liver kidney uh, smooth muscle, uh, LKM, mm -hmm. um, elevated. Um, so ANA, ASMA, or um, LKM antibody elevation, and then um, patient symptoms, how they present it. Uh, if you all put that together, uh, and then you have the histologic features of, you know, plasma cells in the portal areas, plasma cells in the lobules, interface activity, no bile duct injury, and, and that's when you can confidently say that, you know, it's most likely autoimmune hepatitis. I mean, occasionally you can see some bile duct injury with autoimmune hepatitis. Again, you know, there's no uh, hard and fast rule, unfortunately. Everything is possible. Uh, with different disease processes. Uh, but on, on average, you shouldn't see like a florid duct lesion that you would see with primary biliary cholangitis. Um, as long as you don't see something like that, uh, an occasionally injured bile duct is not uh, too big of a deal. Uh, but yeah, once you put everything together and if everything falls into place, then you can be sure that this is autoimmune hepatitis. And then you know, um, you also get reassurance because um, your clinicians, they put them on steroids and they respond very well immediately. You know, um, the transaminases, which are elevated, uh, will come down quickly. Um, mm. and, and with the auto, autoimmune hepatitis, you shouldn't see um, uh, alkaline phosphatase uh, elevation. You only see AST, ALT elevation. So, um, Everything has to fall into place. Serology, clinical picture, um, the viral markers, autoimmune markers. Um, yeah. Right. You mentioned some drugs cause, can cause similar picture like autoimmune hepatitis. On the top of your head, do you remember like most common culprits? Uh, minocycline. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like for, yeah, that's given for acne, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, that can cause very similar pattern. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, got you. Okay. And the drugs, like these autoantibodies are very specific for uh, autoimmune hepatitis or they can be like uh, increased slightly in other, like with the drugs too, like... Uh... Yeah, so um, a, I would never rely only on ANA. ANA is very non-specific. Yeah, I know. But like the others, like anti-mitochondrial and the uh, others, like... Yeah. Uh, ASMA, usually, again, a minimal elevation, you always have to look at the titer. A lot of times, um, especially when we get these biopsies from private labs, they don't give us the titers. All they give mm -hmm. us is um, uh, just... Uh, uh, they just say, instead of giving the titers, they say... They give absolute values, which is not very helpful. Um, then they give the range and then they say, you know, the range is one to 25, but this patient's ASMA is like 50. To us that it shows somewhat that it's elevated, but it really doesn't give you the magnitude of elevation, right? But with a, a tighter, you know, one is to 800 is a severe magnitude elevation, right? or one is to 260, anything above one is to 120 or one is to 160 is, is, is a better um, indicator that it's, it's truly elevated, you know? If okay. it's less than one is to 80, then we kind of don't give too much weightage to it. Even if it's ASMA or, um, you know, AMA or uh, anti-liver kidney 
Uh, and then sometimes when the titer is high and you don't see finding on the biopsy, do you ask them to like, like do you get re biopsies? Like since the clinician is like highly suspicious based on the titers. Yeah, you can do that. Um, uh, a lot of times, what we've seen is uh, sometimes this has happened when patients with um, uh, other autoimmune diseases such as SLE, you know, lupus patients, they're already on some kind of immunosuppression. And so the titers are high, but you're not seeing the histologic picture. And then if you look back at their medication history, they are somewhat immunosuppressed already. And so um, that is one of the reasons why you would see that there is a higher titer, but you're not seeing the histologic picture uh, of classic autoimmune hepatitis. Um, but, but then yes. in such situation, a rebiopsy won't help either, like because the patient it is on. Usually the... doesn't. It usually doesn't. So in such cases, you know, it's better for them to not just look at the um, the titers of the uh, autoimmune markers, but also look at the liver enzymes, especially transaminases. You know, if the titers are high and the transaminases are not too elevated, say for instance, you know, the upper limit of your ALT AST is somewhere around 35, 40, right? So if, um, if they're closer to that upper limit, then I don't think there is a true need to worry too much. But if they are in their hundreds, you know, 300, 400, um, then you, you can suggest that in a month or two, they can try re-biopsying a different region of the liver and see, because if we don't know if it's, if it's not involving the entire liver yet or you know, if it's just that one phase where the findings were not there. Um, yeah, those are the things you can consider. Sure, thank you. Yeah. Dr. Aki, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, is there a, like, what's the difference between lobular versus interface pattern? Is it just the extension of the spillage or like what makes them different? Well, um, interface is pretty, like I said, pretty close to the, it's the periportal hepatocytes. Yes, the spillage is coming mainly from the portal areas, mm -hmm. but it's kind of restricted to not like more than, you know, uh, a little bit. Like if I have to count the number of hepatocytes, not more than like seven or eight uh, series of hepatocytes from the portal area, right? So okay. this is kind of interface in this region. If okay. there, if say for instance, from here to here, all these hepatocytes were involved, then it, I would call this severe interface hepatitis. But in this case, only you know a couple of hepatocytes here are involved. So this is mild interface. But lobular is, it's not just restricted to these periportal hepatocytes, it's coming in all the way into the lobules here, okay. closer to the central vein, because we have the central vein here. Right. So it's, it's coming all the way here. And so it happens both from the portal area here all the way towards this central vein and then from the portal area all the way from here towards these central veins. So the entire stretch can have inflammatory cells and there is extensive lobular inflammation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And one more question. Um, can you explain what uh, fluorid duct injury uh, would look like? Oh, sure. I mean, when we go to PBC, if we have time, yeah. Okay, um, thank you. Let's see, we can try looking at that next. Let's see. Sorry, someone else was gonna ask me something else. Sorry, I was asking about grading. Like, uh, how do you decide your like limits for the grading? Uh, grading what, sorry? Like when we say like it is stage four, grade three uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. cirrhosis, then like that grading part for that is like, how, how is that? Uh, so staging, as you know, is depending on the extent of fibrosis, right? Yeah. So, you know, if it's only portal, it's stage one. If it's portal and periportal, it's stage two. I'm going by the Bats and Ludwig system. Yeah. Um, and then if it's bridging fibrosis, it's stage three. And then, you know, if there's nodule formation, it's stage four. So staging is pretty uniform across all chronic hepatitis pattern of injury. And, and in even in, uh, cirrhosis due to steatohepatitis staging is pretty similar. Grading um, is for the activity, meaning like inflammatory activity is yeah. what is graded. 
Mm-hmm. So um, usually that kind of grading um, for viral hepatitis and autoimmune, uh, we don't use uh, grade one, two, or three. Instead, we say mild, moderate, severe. The grade one, two, or three uh, grading is used mainly for um, NASH, non-alcoholic theater hepatitis. That's the Brunt criteria. Um, mm-hmm. And so, like I said, mild grade uh, activity is when it's like there's mild spillover from the portal areas into the neighboring hepatocytes. Uh, and if you see that consistently in about 80% of the portal areas, then you call it mild. Um, uh, so you say chronic hepatitis pattern of injury, uh, m- mild active, mildly active, and then you can say uh, stage four uh, or stage two, whatever the stage is. Um, but if you see in 50% of the portal areas, it's mild, and in another 50%, it's moderate. You can say mild to moderate. Um, it's, it's a little subjective, but overall it works out because you're telling the clinicians how bad it is. And then, you know, they can like up the uh, treatment. So for viral hepatitis, they'll up, up their medication or try to make sure that the patient is taking the uh, antivirals properly. Uh, and for autoimmune, they'll make sure that the patient is... Uh, uh, taking the immunosuppression properly. Is the pericellular and perisinusoidal fibrosis kind of interchangeable terms or they are different? They're, um, in some textbooks, they use interchangeably, but um, if you were to go by the actual definition, they are different. Um, so pericellular, I mean, we, we use the term pericellular fibrosis uh, classically for steatohepatitis, right? Um, and then perisinusoidal is, uh, I love to show it. We are jumping from topic to topic, sorry. <laughs> uh, let's see if we have any. Maybe here in the Michigan one, steatohepatitis hepatitis with Beijing fibrosis. Let's see if this opens up. You can try NASH. NASH in uh, Path Presenter? Yeah, yeah. Michigan took a county. Oh, Michigan. Okay. No, no. Uh, Path Presenter. Try NASH. Okay, yeah. Mm. Okay, let's see. Where yeah, they have trichrome. So, see here, we know for sure that this is portal area, right? There is nodule formation. Mm-hmm. There's bile ducts here. This is a bile duct. This is, um, this is an artery. So these are all bile ducts, see? This long one and this small one, these are all bile ducts. So now we know that this whole area is portal. And then based on that, If you see this slit-like space, this is a central vein. Um, So we have fibrosis here surrounding the hepatocytes. And um, I I understand it's the terminology can be very challenging. And, you know, no matter how many times I tell, it might seem like I'm making up stuff, but um, pericellular is that when you see this fibrosis so strictly surrounding the hepatocyte itself, the membrane of the hepatocyte, that's where, that's what's referred to as pericellular. But once you start seeing fibrosis in the sinusoidal area, then it's perisinusoidal. Um, What significance it has? So pericellular fibrosis is something that you see with um, steatohepatitis, hepatitis, meaning like you have a balloon hepatocyte and that eventually, you know, steatohepatitis hepatitis eventually will lead to uh, fibrosis and cirrhosis. So that's the starting point. But perisinusoidal fibrosis is something that you would see 
in patients with hemodynamic abnormalities. So say for instance, someone has, you know, um, a cardiac failure because of, uh, you know, patients with uh, hypoplastic left heart sometimes have Fontan procedure and they have uh, elevated pressures in, in the liver. So as a result, there is sinusoidal dilatation. So excessive pressure on the sinusoids from the portal uh, venus, um, no, sorry, not the portal venus, but excessive pressure on the sinusoids from the uh, blood upstream can over time trigger um, development of uh, or conversion of ito cells into myofibroblasts. And so that's what triggers uh, perisinusoidal fibrosis. So the, the mechanism or, or the location can somewhat hint towards the etiology too. So if you see classic chicken wire, like you saw here, then, and, and especially if it's associated with ballooned hepatocytes, then it's more classic for steatohepatitic pattern of injury. But if it's perisinusoidal, you'll have to see a lot of livers with fibrosis to appreciate that, unfortunately. If we have, um, I don't know if we would have, how I could search, maybe congestive hepatopathy. Probably not. Mm. So in congestive hepatopathy, you can see um, perisinusoidal fibrosis. So in this particular case, what would be your fibrosis stage? Like it's not oh. bridging yet. And it's like, uh, it's pericellular and the portal tracts are expanded. So is it like kind of three or it's already four for you? So here, let's see. It's definitely, the portal areas are definitely expanded here. And then in fact here, you can see a little bit of nodule formation too. Mm -hmm. um, so I would, I would say it's kind of three. Okay. I would, I'd, I'd hesitate to call it four right away because just the nature of the biopsy, but my, my hunch is that this liver is heading towards complete cirrhosis. Um, I think, should we stop? Because uh, it's five or six already. Yeah, I think you have to go. Um, so we can do the, the uh, remaining cases tomorrow, whatever we can, uh, four to five again. Focus on you know, steatohepatitis hepatitis if you want, fatty liver, and then uh, we still have PBC and PSC to look at as well. Yeah, yeah. If you could show that uh, uh, fluoroductylar reaction in PBC quickly, like in a second, oh, sure. um, that question will be answered for you. Yeah, yeah, let's see that primary biliary. Let's see if they have it here. You don't have to explain everything, just that the fluoroductylar reaction you can show that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Because here they have an X plant. Let's see if uh, Michigan has. Usually in X plants, it's hard to see uh, the, the, the fluorid duct lesion because they're already cirrhotic, right? Uh, hmm. Try PRI. It will be complete PRI. PRI. Hmm. Yeah. Nothing? Filter. Yeah, filter. Primary biliary cirrhosis. Let's see. Nothing over oh, here. Yeah. Okay, I should have it. So fluorid duct lesion is nothing but the bile duct is so injured. The bile duct injury can happen in many different forms. But in um, uh, PBC, as you know, there's a, a big inflammatory infiltrate in the portal area. And um, one of the main forms of fluorid duct lesion is the lymphocytes are attacking the bile duct. So you can see a ton of lymphocytes in the bile duct epithelium. And as a result, the, the uh, architecture of the bile duct, instead of it being, you know, because normal healthy bile duct should look like a pearl necklace, right? Uniformly spaced nuclei. I'm trying to see 
where we have it. Leave it. We'll leave that question for next time then, because uh, it, it will delay your plans. Okay, let's see if I can Google for it that lesion here. That way. Oh yeah, here. So look at this portal area, it's so blue, right? A lot of inflammatory cells. And then you look at this bile duct. Um, so normal bile duct should look like a, a pearl necklace, but see how this bile duct is like irregular, somewhat linear, but also irregular. And then if you look closely, I think, let's see. Um, there are inflammatory cells in the bile duct, like see all these lymphocytes that are going into the bile duct. They're kind of chewing up the bile duct. Um, let's see, there was one more. I think it's, see how they're chewing up the bile ducts, the inflammatory cells here. So these are all lymphocytes that are in the bile duct epithelium. So the normal bile duct, instead of being like round and regular, is all chewed up. Like it's, this is another one. See, here the bile duct is somewhat normal, but look here, the lymphocytes are chewing up the bile duct epithelium, it's disappeared. Um, so though, that's what's referred to as florid duct lesion, meaning that the lymphocytes are attacking the bile duct epithelium from all different sides. And so in essentially, eventually, you know, because of so much, uh, bile duct injury, uh, the bile duct is kind of obliterated. It's eaten up. The, once the epithelium is eaten up or destroyed by the lymphocytes, then the bile duct kind of crumbles. And then, you know, there's granuloma formation, histiocytes come and try to uh, clean, clean it up. So you eventually don't even see a bile duct in, in the portal area. So, uh, but it depends on on what stage it is at. So does that explain these are florid duct lesions? Yes, yes. Nice. thank you very much. Yeah. You're welcome. Cool, so we'll meet tomorrow again, four o'clock. Thank you very much, Dr. Aki. Thank you for your time, and especially you. for taking out time when you were sick. So thank you very much. No problem, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.